It's Sunday, August 10th, 2014, and the reporters aren't taking the summer off. First up, final call. Thousands come out to pay their final respects to Officer Patrick. But should his killer have been out at all? I love you, man. Buzz kill, what's killing the honeybees? A Star Tribune investigative reporter is connecting the dots. Bees have a lot of problems. Khan versus Noor. It's the nasty Democratic throwdown in Minneapolis. Let's talk about the voter fraud. My campaign was accused. We catch up with both candidates still slinging the mud in the home stretch. I'm not sure he totally understands what's going on. The horse race, a crowded field in the GOP primary. Will endorsements make a difference? We think elections matter a lot. Is anyone really paying attention? That one didn't go over so well. <laughs> all that plus an all Republican breakfast club. Elephants don't forget, and neither do we. The reporters to your rescue. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for making the reporters part of your Sunday. There are times when we as a community collectively embrace grief. When we recognize how fragile life can be, even as we appreciate our common humanity. So it was this week with the funeral for Mendota Heights police officer Scott Patrick. Quite frankly, any words I add at this point are simply redundant or inadequate. So I turn it over instead to one of those who knew him best. And I can see him now if he was here. He'd put his arm around me and he'd have a smirk on his face, a twinkle in his eye. He'd say, hey, not bad for a humble grad, huh, cadet? And then I'd respond, obviously. I love you, man. Officer Scott Patrick, badge 2231, is out of service. End of watch, July 30th, 2014. That was just a couple of the moving moments from Officer Scott Patrick's funeral. Police officers from all over the country joining in the nearly eight mile processional. Everything seemed to stop as the communities of West St. Paul and Mendota Heights said their final goodbyes. Some of the most moving images were actually on social media. This one from Pioneer Press photographer Ben Garvin really got me. Will he look after our cat in heaven? Asked this girl to mom as a policeman. He probably would be willing to do so, Mom said. Another from Ben Garvin of Patrick's widow, Michelle, waving to those along the processional. And this one from the pool camera showing a Mendota Heights officer being comforted by a friend. As I said, words inadequate. Plenty of words left to be said for the killer, though. Seems an unnecessary formality to call Brian Fitch an alleged killer at this point. After he admitted to an officer at the hospital that he shot Patrick and he hates cops. Court documents this week revealed last year a judge allowed him to go into a drug treatment program, which he dropped out of, rather than do prison time. Fitch has a court appearance on murder charges scheduled for Monday. Unclear if he will be well enough to leave the hospital. At last report, he was in serious condition. Some stories we cover are like icebergs, and it takes some real digging before you get below the surface and see the absolute enormity of what's at stake. So it is with an awesome series of reports in the Star Tribune about what's happening to our honeybees, which seem to be dying off in epic numbers. Bees have a lot of problems, um, and they all are sort of connected. We met investigative reporter Josephine Marcotti at the Harriet Rose Garden. Ironic, given the roses and flowers here are mostly hybrids with no smell and little interest to bees. We bred these flowers for our pleasure and not for the bees' pleasure. It's the kind of depressing accident permeating her Star Tribune series, Bees in the Brink, which traces the rise of neonicotinoids, or neonics, a synthetic nicotine toxic to insects, but not humans or animals. A lot of the old pesticides, uh, insects were developing resistance, so the pesticides weren't working anymore. And uh, these were much less toxic to people, and so farmers and applicators really glommed onto them quickly. But the rise of neonics roughly parallels the global die-off of honeybees, entire colonies collapsing including those here in Minnesota. The beekeepers say that they lose between 25 and 30 percent of their bees every winter, and it used to be 10 to 15 percent. The problem, Marcotti says, is how we grow our food. Big Ag has given us monocultures, whether it's genetically identical corn in the Midwest or almonds in Central California, 
where many Minnesota beekeepers head every spring to pollinate the crops. You know, I talked to a researcher this week who said that two thirds of the cropland around the world has neonics in it. So that's like, that's like a massive amount of land where neonics are applied every year. Bayer, the largest producer of neonics, disputes any connection, blaming parasites instead. Bayer even opening up its own bee research lab this year. But like the climate change debate a decade ago, there's a growing scientific consensus neonics are to blame. And for big ag, that's a buzzkill. There are something like 50 studies that have been done that show a clear link between uh, the, the use of neonicotinoids and decline in insects, honeybees included. Uh, then the industry will do a lot of other, show a lot of other studies that say it's not that clear, but a lot of those are conducted by the industry. The EPA is now reviewing the science behind neonics, but the results won't be known until 2018. So Tuesday is primary day, and it could be the end of a very long era for state rep Phyllis Khan. She is facing her toughest challenger in well, 42 years. Mahmoud Noor is a charismatic leader in the Somali community. It is a race that's had a little of everything. Fights, allegations of fraud, a caucus do-over, and no party endorsement. And the next few days could be the most interesting yet. Why do you think this race has been so contentious? Well, uh, if I look at this race, I think this district, you look at it, this is one of the unique districts in the state. Uh, you know, the demographic, this district has changed. The needs have changed. Mohamed Noor is the very face of that changing demographic. Stretching along both sides of the Mississippi and Minneapolis, House District 60B includes Cedar Riverside, Seward, and the university. Some calling it the campaign of three S's, students, seniors, and Somalis. Phyllis Khan has represented this district since 1972, the year of the Watergate break-in. On the pro side, Phyllis Khan has been in for 42 years. Yes. On the con side, she's been in for 42 years. <laughs> How do you look at this? Okay, well, when I look at it is the first thing I do is I pull out my record. This Democratic primary has revealed deep rifts in the Somali community. City Councilman Abdi Warsami endorsing Khan, who was instrumental in redrawing the boundaries that helped get him elected. There was a second caucus after a brawl broke out at the first, and an election judge who offered a biased translation. This line is the, a Somali brother, and this line is the old Jewish lady. <laughs> so uh, Let's talk about the voter fraud. My campaign was accused. And Khan even accused the Noor campaign, falsely it turns out, of voter fraud. Because more than 100 people had registered to vote using a P.O. box at 419 Cedar. Not legal, but also apparently not intentional. By and large, it's devolved into a schoolyard brawl. And this person running against me is very ambitious. He's like the fourth thing he's tried to get. Khan, who has a Ph.D. in biophysics from Yale, has been a liberal lightning rod over the years, but she now chairs the Legacy Committee, which lets her bring home the bacon. My district got the highest percentage of appropriations from the bonding bill this year to the university, and I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, and there are no freshmen on the Ways and Means Committee. But Noor, a school board member who narrowly lost a bid for the state senate, has made universal preschool his priority issue, and says Khan hasn't done enough for the community, especially its newest members. I really respect uh, Representative Phyllis Khan, but in today's society, seniority hasn't helped much. How good a job do you think you have done looking out for the Somali oh, community? Oh, I've done that's a your... super job on that. Everything that touches the society, we have to deal it in one whole picture. You talk a lot about big picture things. Correct. Big picture things that are awfully hard to change. And, and that's what legislators are supposed to be doing. You know, somebody who's going to represent the community has to understand the bigger picture. But we also, politicians I know, look for the quick wins. Right. Things that they can get done when they get in. Mm -hmm. What would some of your quick wins be? Uh, one of my quick wins, I'll always repeat, I want to make sure that my kids have a better opportunity. I want all the children have a better opportunity. Education is a key. Someone says they're going to come in and be a leader. <laughs> You don't, that isn't the way the legislature works. I'm not sure he totally understands what's going on. I actually already absentee voted. Oh, okay. So go out on the okay. campaign trail yeah, and it seems most folks have already made up their minds. They already well, voted. Thank you, Two bye. weeks ago for you. But it's voter turnout that may ultimately decide this race. At Minneapolis City Hall, there's been a steady tide of voters coming in to vote early. Many of them Somalis. 
But say this, voters have a clear choice in 60B. The youth and vision of an outsider or the pragmatism of an experienced lawmaker, the ultimate insider. And it's less than a week. It's Tuesday. Khan, by the way, got the Star Tribune endorsement. In a different time, candidates coveted newspaper endorsements, probably not as much anymore in the current media landscape. But even as some newspapers are getting out of the endorsement biz completely, the Star Tribune says that is still part of its mission. I sat down with editorial page editor Scott Gillespie, who explained that a dozen people interviewed the candidates for about 90 minutes, the newsroom not involved in this. He acknowledged that with Glenn Taylor buying the paper, people will probably be looking for any conservative tilt, especially in the general election. He says they're still looking for politicians who have experience, new ideas, and can reach across party lines. But he says the Republican gubernatorial primary presented some unique challenges. The, the major surprise on the gubernatorial side was how much the four candidates are alike on the issues. Uh, really tough to, we would ask them, how are you different from, your, from the other three? And they didn't have very good answers for that. So the voters have a tough time sorting through those four candidates, I think. Do you think it comes down to a personality contest then? I do. They almost, they all admit that. They say that. That, uh, well, it's not so much about where we are on the issues, it's about who we are. And in the end, the Star Tribune gave a nod to the endorsed candidate, Hennepin County Commissioner Jeff Johnson. Sounds like they were also pretty impressed with former state rep Marty Seifert. Former House Speaker Kurt Zellers hurt, they say, by his role in the government shutdown, and the editorial board said businessman Scott Honor has the bank account, but maybe not quite the experience, not yet. In the primary for Al Franken's Senate seat, the Strib endorses state lawmaker Jim Abler, a well-respected policy guy, kind of a policy wonk, over businessman Mike McFadden, who has the party endorsement. We are going to talk a lot more about both races coming up in the Breakfast Club. But the Vikings play their first preseason game Friday night at the retrofitted TCF Stadium. The capper to a very busy sports week. Don Mitchell joining us from TCF. Don, first want to talk ba basketball with you. Kevin Love, trade worked out in principle with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Are the Wolves resigned to the fact that they won't field a championship team or even be a playoff contender and they're just fine with that? You know, no team, Tom, is ever content with that. But some people are saying that Glenn Taylor will pay enough to get a star here, but maybe not enough to surround a star with more. We've seen that with Kevin Garnett. We're seeing it now with Kevin Love. But you know what? Right when you want to compare the Kevins, you have to look at their personalities. Kevin Garnett did it perhaps the right way from a PR standpoint. And a lot of fans here are saying that Kevin Love is not. So I, I think they, all the fans here know the business of it. And they understand the business of it. They wish more money was spent to bring all the stars here. But they also understand that Kevin Love wants to go where LeBron James is. But they're probably not happy that someone else is leaving once again. Right. Uh, let's talk about Vikings. Uh, they have a rep, obviously, for being an indoor team. How do you think they'll adjust to TCF? You know what they play out what people forget is they play outdoor all the other eight games of the year sometimes they don't always play in domes so it'll be interesting even a lot of the players saying it's a different drive here it's a different locker room so maybe for these first few games it's it's an away game of sorts but these guys professionals and they've been in so many different ones i think it's going to be fine what what that's going to be key is when the winter comes here and the kickers and if they can get home field advantage so i think they'll do great tom but what how quickly can they claim their home field and own it for the next two years is going to be the question yeah i, I remember that that uh that one game that was played there with all the snow it was wonderful but i think the novelty will wear off let's talk quarterbacks it's been quarterback roulette for years years now. Are we ever going to settle this? You know what? I think it will be settled, but it may not be settled for the first few games. I mean, come on, let's be honest. Teddy Bridgewater is a rookie. Ten tonight at the first game, the first preseason game, you will see Matt Castle get the start. Then you'll see Teddy Bridgewater get some snaps, of course, with the first team. They want to see what this kid can do, but they're also very conscious, and Norv Turner is a pro at this. Let's not throw him into the fire and not handle it. And, and don't forget Christian Ponder. He's going to get some reps, probably going to play in the fourth quarter, but let me tell you, if Teddy Bridgewater impresses people and he can do what a lot of the coaches are saying he's doing in training camp, Tom, we might see him, but let's not be fooled. Matt Castle is a vet. He's played in the NFL. He knows how to win games. He's going to be the starter unless he loses it to an upstart. So we'll have to wait and see. Okay, job there for the taking. Thanks a lot, Don. Coming up, it's a very Republican-looking breakfast club. We are talking GOP primary. Back after this. Marty Seifert. I was raised on a family farm in southwest Minnesota. 
My dad had an eighth grade education and taught us the value of hard work. This is a lot like Mark Dayton behind the wheel of state government. He's unpredictable, he can't see a disaster when it's right in front of him. And the only thing he gets right are the hard left turns. I've never raised taxes, and I'll never do it as your governor either. And the only candidate in the race that has the guts to put it in writing. He's a businessman, an outsider. You betcha. He'd be the only candidate who's not a politician. The only one. So now he's... That is just a little sampling of the commercials we are seeing from the Republican candidates for governor. It is a four-way battle. Crowded field, Marty Seifer, Kurt Zellers, Jeff Johnson, and Scott Honor all want to be the GOP nominee. Primaries Tuesday to see who will take on Governor Dayton in November. Got an all GOP breakfast club for you here today. Jack Tomzek from the Up and Adam show on TC News Talk AM 1130. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Republican political analyst Sarah Janicek over here and Kelly Gunderson, who is a frequent talk radio contributor. Let's talk governor's race, guys. Crowded field. What strikes me is they're dropping out of the debates left and right. Only uh, Seifert was willing to show up for the CCO debate. And at least if you buy the Star Tribune, not much difference between them. What do you make, Sarah? Well, this is our first mid-August primary. Last time we had a contested primary for governor and the GOP uh, side of the aisle, there were 160,000 voters. I don't think we're going to get even close. They're talking 5% so, voter turnout, So maybe. the candidate who's got the best ground game, and theoretically who has done that through absentee ballots, a first, you don't need an excuse, should be the winner. But we understand from Mark Ritchie this week, or last week, that absentee ballots are not as, as a great a number as we expected. In 2010, 2010, the Democrats spent $10 million up to the primary. Republicans have spent up almost two, and half that is Scott Honors. There's not as much excitement as I thought there would be in this, and frankly, I don't know who's going to win, and anybody who says they do uh, is lying. I don't even know if Republicans care, do they, Kelly? Well, At this I, point, really. I think actually quite a few of them do. I was seeing numbers estimating 15% turnout possibly on Tuesday, and, and that's even more than in years past. I think what we have to look at here, too, is that the governor's uh, race hasn't had a primary for 20 years on the Republican side. So a lot of people like me, 45 and under, this is a new game for us. And so I think it's going to be really interesting what happens on Tuesday. Are we excited about the candidates? I ask that in all seriousness. Uh, you know, I, I think of um, some of the things that I, uh, some of the people I thought we'd be talking about, I thought we would be talking about Julie Rosen in the mix. Uh, there were some other big names that I thought m might jump in. And so many people seem scared away. And does it look good for the party to have four white men? I had hoped we'd have Julie Rosen in the race as well, and, and I, I think your question's a great one. There is not a good high level of excitement. They are interchangeable on issues. I think, uh, you know, as, as, as best I understand it, I think that Seifert's probably got the best ground game because he's got the rural mm -hmm. thing and he's been pushing the range. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there's such dissatisfaction with, electoral, with elected people that honor's got a chance. I think people are tired of of people who set out to be governor at the age of 16. We've had enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> and they are going to have a lot in common, so there's not going to be there a whole lot of difference on policy because they're all from the same party. Um, I don't know about uh, Marty Seifert having the best ground game, but uh, I spend a lot of my time on radio and not out doing politics, so maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and I don't know, we'll see. And I think being on the ground game, I think actually Marty has not done as well as I think a lot of people had thought, I think he's hurting himself in the, met, in the metro area by s focusing on the outstate. Let's talk about the Senate primary. Uh, Al Franken, 538, the website that kind of dopes, mm -hmm. the, dopes all the political races, gave him a 95% probability of winning. Certainly that can't possibly be true. Uh, I mean, I, I think given Obama's approval ratings, he, he must be, uh, it's going to be less than that. We what haven't even seen the, anything come in from out of state. And I think that nationally Republicans and independent expenditures are just going to hammer on Obamacare and, and haven't helped Al Franken, no, haven't don't help Al Franken, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, who's voted lockstep with, lockstep with the president? He's, his, his voting record, he's vulnerable. You know, I saw that graph that Nate Silver did, and it, it was funny how there was about 10 races up at the top mm -hmm. that went 99-1 to down to Franken was 95-5. Then he's got this big jump going to 65-35 right. and then right in the middle and then at the same jump at the end. I, I think Nate's not doing enough groundwork. Jack, who do you think the best candidate is in the, in the primary? The, there's a split between the endorsement and, and the party endorsement and the Star Tribune endorsement. Who do you think's best? As far as 
Best to take on, best to beat. Mike McFadden. You think Mike, why? He's got the money, he can attract national attention. Al Franken's got some natural advantages being in a blue state here, mm -hmm. but he's done the work. He'll get national and attention, the money will he's come. An, he's the ultimate outsider, which yeah. is a real and he's, positive. Yeah. He's got a personality. I yeah. really think, I've been observing this for 20 years, I'm not a political yeah. expert like you guys, but I gotta tell you, I think Minnesotans have the beer test. I think they, mm -hmm. by and large, people pick, pick people, Democrat or Republican, mm -hmm. that they wanna have a beer with. Well, yeah. I will amend that, a friendly amendment. I always think the person who wins is the person who has the most optimistic message for the future, mm -hmm. because that's what an election is. It's a bet on the future. And I think that McFadden will be easily able to outdo Al Franken in that regard, and it'll. I think I think McFadden's got a great shot at winning. Do Republicans need a new issue right now? They're going on Mincher and they're going on uh, state office building. Do they have a better issue? I don't. No. Ten think seconds. So. No. no. Okay, they need to find one. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we okay. go on the record when Thanks, we come Tom. back. <laughs> That's my advice. <laughs> Love just left us for Cleveland, and I'm pissed, and I'm gonna burn his jersey, and I just need some angry Minnesotans to help me out. So who's with me? We have a men's basketball team here. I think instead of burning his jersey, we should send him a thank you card for trying so hard. Hey man, leave Kevin Garnett alone. I like that. I like that. Right? Oh! <laughs> Time to go on the record about Love's labor lost. As that video from comedian Mike Brody illustrates, here in Minnesota, we're not very good at getting angry. We should feel abandoned and hurt that Kevin Love is leaving the Twin Cities for Cleveland of all places. Forbes recently ranked us the eighth most miserable sports market. Atlanta was number one. But instead of getting angry at players who leave to get a shot at a championship, we internalize our hurt and anger. It's not you, we think, it's really us that somehow we're not good enough. Minnesotans are codependent sports fans, I've decided, and we need some therapy. What we need to do is we need to pick up the mirror and say, I deserve a winning team. Doggone it, and I am good enough. What's more, as a taxpayer, I paid for your stadium. I've subsidized your silly game. You owe this to me. Say it again, repeat often, and get angry. That's the reporters, we'll see you again next week.